HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Powder donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Most of you, I am sure by now, know that Audible.com is a leading provider of audiobooks, but you may not know all the other content that they offer on their platform. So we are offering you a free trial, so you can check it out for yourself. You can go to audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth and explore. The Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast uh, over the years has uh, continued to enjoy inclusion on lists of the best podcasts to listen to for sales, entrepreneurship, small business. Um, we, it just continues. Uh, we continue to gain recognition as a great resource for uh, business leaders and entrepreneurs. And that's because of the guests. Uh, these are folks who have expertise in particular areas of business and they join me for a conversation where they share that expertise with all of you. That way, you can get the answers to the questions you have, you can get ideas and suggestions of things that you can implement in your business. And the goal is that you are able to uh, do bigger and better things and be happier and more successful. Today is no exception. My guest today is Kyle Hegarty. Kyle is the Managing Director of Leadership Nomad, a division of TSL Marketing, where he focuses on helping companies such as IBM, Lufthansa, GSK, and Oracle expand globally. Kyle looks at how companies connect with their customers while focusing on communication, sales, marketing, and management leadership. He has trained thousands of executives, is a faculty lecturer for Singapore Management University, 
and is a frequent speaker at business and management conferences around the world. And Kyle is also the author of The Accidental Business Nomad. Thanks so much for joining me today, Kyle. Thank you so much. There's, uh, you, you put a lot of pressure now on uh, all of the great guests that you've had in the past. So <laughs> It is a pretty high bar to live up to, but I don't think you'd be here if I didn't think you were going to be able to. So it's all good. Okay. Well, thank you again for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, so this whole concept of, of being a business nomad is interesting for me and um, and how you help companies expand globally. And, and one of my questions is really around uh, cultural differences and how a business owner or a business person who's starting to, to sort of go out there, how do they navigate um, what seems to be like an invisible language of cultural misunderstandings? Well, that, you know, that, that's the big question that I that I try and address in this book. And uh, by the way, I'm I'm here in Singapore, so I don't know how many time zones away from from you I am. But uh, about 15 years ago, I moved from the United States over to Singapore to help Western companies figure out how they were going to expand across Southeast Asia. And over and over again, what I kept seeing was regardless of company size, it could be a startup, it could be a, a small little business, all the way up to the very large companies, but all of them seemed to wrestle with some of these invisible cultural differences that you mentioned. And I myself did as well. In, in fact, I'm, I'm exhibit A uh, in terms of making all of these mistakes. And I'll, I'll give you just one example. Great. I showed up, um, hired somebody locally and was thought we were all on the same page. She spoke English. I was speaking English. We signed a contract. Uh, and then on day one, she just didn't show up. And on day two, she didn't show up. And then day three, <laughs> she did. And this was not an entry level role. This was like a pretty, you know, I mean, it wasn't super senior, but still you'd think that on day, you'd think you'd show up to the to the job. Um, and, and again, it's not to say that people in certain parts of the world don't do that, but it was crystal clear right from the get-go that things just were different in different parts of the world. Expectations were different. What I thought was crystal clear was not crystal clear oh. to other people. And that was something that just kept happening on repeat. I mean, I, I could, I could, that this book could be 20 times the size it is. Uh, I simply chose a couple of, of handful of stories here and there, but these obstacles continue to pop up. Uh, and even companies that, that aren't doing the travel, like most of us are, are a bit stuck these days, we can't get on the airplanes as much, uh, yeah. we're still facing this stuff because we are on these Zoom calls, on Skype calls. We are trying to do these partnership deals. We are expanding potentially into new markets. And what I think is absolutely clear communication. What the way I approach a business relationship to me makes perfect sense. And what I find over and over again is that that's not the case in other parts of the world. So I wrote this book to tell those stories and to start going down that path to get, hopefully to help people avoid these mistakes that just keep happening over and over again. Okay, so you gotta tell me, why didn't she show up? What, what was that? What ended up being the story? Um, she, in this case, she had a, a sick relative in, in another, in Malaysia. This was in Singapore and Malaysia is, a, you, know, you can get over a bridge to, to cross over to Malaysia. And I, look, I mean, I, I'm not gonna put words into her mouth, but uh, she essentially, her excuse was that this obviously, you know, family takes precedence, which, absolutely fine with that. But to me, you know, you, you would have communicated that. Yeah. Uh, and then she, she showed up on day three thinking everything was fine. I was like, no, this is, you're, you're, you're not, you're fired. I mean, <laughs> and she was shocked. She was absolutely shocked. Absolutely shocked. Uh, uh, another, another fascinating example, which is actually really sad. Uh, we had a whole team in Philippines and this woman we hired, uh, I think she was, we hired her at an entry level 
and just when somebody has it and you, you just know it, I mean, this, this person was just, she was on the ball. She just got everything done. Clients loved her. Every, I mean, she was just in a small company. She stood out and she got uh, promoted and she moved up the, the food chain very quickly. We had plans to actually get her ownership status and, and to kind of put her into a managing director track. We were invest, we were ready to invest in all this stuff. Uh, a storm came through Philippines and knocked the roof off of her family house where she and her mother lived. You know, these monsoons are unfortunately coming in greater frequency uh, yeah. there. And the mother decided that this was an omen and forced the entire family to move into the country province where she came from. And without second thought, uh, our point of con, our woman just up and quit. She, I think she gave us a day notice uh, because wow. even at the age of 32, you do what your mother tells you to do. And that was the end of it. And I would bet you today that she is living in a, you know, in a, I, I don't want to, a third world is, is kind yeah. of a, a past term, but I mean, you know, that, that's, she, she went in a very different direction uh, because of that. And, you know, th where, where do you, where does that come up in the, um, in the business school lessons? Yeah, <laughs> right. It's <right. laughs> a good question. It doesn't, that's part of the problem. So, so it's part of the problem it's part of the adventure it depends on how you look yeah, at it um, that's a really good point yeah i mean i i think that one of the things that that personally i had to go through and so many people especially from the u.s go through is that we um we're all we're ready to roll and we're very much you know excited and ready to do business and get deals done and, and move things forward and that approach while it sounds i think all positive comes across in some parts of the world as a negative and actually yeah. slows things down or ruins relationships. Wow. And that's a massive thing that people need to be, I think that people need to be aware of. Um, you know, you talk about invisible working styles. Uh, there are everything that excites me about a deal about, you know, a fast moving deal can put my counterpart completely off. Even though we might be aligned on trying to trying to get to a goal, a, a collective goal. Okay, so so how does someone figure that out? I mean, you don't want to head in and and make mistakes that then you can't re recover from, and and out of ignorance, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. That look. That look. That's the big question. Um, yeah. And. Um, I think that a couple things is that you're going to make mistakes. Everybody's going to make mistakes. I continue yeah. to make mistakes. And so the willingness to accept that mistakes will be made, um, the, the goal would be to minimize those mistakes, learn from them and figure out positive ways to move forward. Uh, the minimize them is the thing that I really focus on, which is, what are the skill sets that people need in order to try and avoid some of these mega problems? And, and I can get into more detail on that, but the whole yeah. subtitle of the book is called A Survival Guide for Working Across a Shrinking Planet. And <laughs> what I'm trying to do is throughout the book, it's, it's not a typical business book because it's not like a prescriptive, you know, here's, here's a case study, here's, here's kind of a you know, here's my 10, I, here's my 10 arguments. Here's a example. Next chapter. This is more of just sort of this um, free flowing narrative story of looking at a couple of characters and the things that they go through and some of the aha moments that they either have or probably should have. Uh, and then just what happens kind of as what happens as life takes them down these journeys. So I, I was much more interested in a character based hmm. narrative than more of a business type of um approach which which makes the book a little bit i think easier to read and a little bit more yeah fun. i would think yeah yeah hard in some ways harder to sell in that it's just not a typical business book so it's, it's not your you know right. here's your five steps to going global like i i just i just haven't 
found the five step formula. Nobody has. It's just it's more complicated than that. But you know, rather than tell somebody, here's the five things you need to do. It's like it's like let's combine uh, storytelling with specific data and targeted anecdotes that help get people a, a clearer sense of what they're up against. Okay, so. I, I totally appreciate that, and I do think it is probably easier to read and absorb because storytelling, you know, is so powerful. Um, and if you met someone who said, "Hey, I'm heading over to Singapore to talk to you know X, Y, and Z about a deal. We, we've been talking about it, and it seems like they're interested in you know going a little deeper. Yeah. Are there?" Um, suggestions that you would give them so that they could prepare absolutely great um, yes that's a that's a great way to put it and that's probably a good way to think about it just as one example and you can cut and paste you know any country or scenario that, into this answer but okay the way the way I approach this is a couple of a couple of pieces and this might sound prescriptive and, and, it, and to a degree it is a little bit but the first thing I recommend everybody to do is Take time uh, to understand yourself, understand the invisible stuff that you are doing on a daily basis. And this is easier said than done because the stuff that you and I do on a daily basis, if we do it routinely, we don't even know we're doing it. Uh, and that actually is what culture is. C culture is the invisible stuff that we just do without really thinking twice about it. Uh -huh. uh, and so it's a really helpful and interesting exercise to take that step back and say, well, what is my communication style? Uh, do I, am I very direct? Am I task focused? Do I talk around in circles or do I like to put a, you know, personal aspect to a business component or am I more interested in facts and figures? And, and there's nothing right or wrong about any of them, but there are trends. And so if you can understand that this is what you tend to preference, it's a really good starting point to be able to understand your new counterpart who will be in front of you. Because maybe you are outgoing, talkative, uh, like to talk about big ideas, but all of a sudden the person that you're trying to do a project with might be the opposite. Uh, she might be reserved. She might be more introverted, focused entirely on facts and figures and not sharing anything personal about themselves. Who's right and who's wrong? Uh, I, my answer is I don't care who's right or wrong. It's up to you to get this deal done from a yeah. business perspective, right? So yeah. how do you then adjust to make that person feel more comfortable to be able to build a relationship and, and get you know, get results. So the, the first step, I, I, I use behavioral profiling. Uh, I'm sure you've covered some of these in previous uh, discussions. I, yeah. I do find that, um, I find the DISC is really helpful. I end up writing about it. it. It's one of the old, old standbys. It holds up across cultures, which I really like because some of the tests are very Western centric. DISC seems to hold up. I, I've, done disc work with people from, I think, 75 countries. Wow. And everybody seems to get it. So that, that's been huh. very positive for me. Yeah, no um, kidding. That's interesting. Yeah. There, there, are other, um, there are other tests that are definitely more Western-centric, and they don't really translate the same way. And, and it's sometimes the um, behaviors or person, it depends if you're doing a behavioral test or a personality test, but sometimes uh, they, things do get lost in translation. So I, I've personally found that DISC is a helpful tool to use when working across cultures. So that would be my very long-winded answer to your initial question as, as, one, as one tool that people could think about using. So I, I love this idea of figuring out your own communication style first because I think then it, it prompts the question, okay, what is the other person's communication exactly. style? Yeah. yeah. And, 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 I, and often, um, often what you get, and I'll, I'll talk about West East, just since we're, we're down this path, okay. uh, is 
the, the people who tend to venture overseas to try and do international deals or to open up new offices, et cetera, they tend to be dominant personality types that are outgoing, that are very driven, that are very task focused, goal oriented. They kind of get to the bottom line quickly. They don't really screw around. And the markets that they're often expanding into are traits that are almost the opposite of everything I just said. Wow. They are more focused on creating a sense of harmony. Uh, they believe in avoiding conflicts. They listen first and talk second. They um, tend to avoid, you know, or, or they, they build relationships in a much slower, steadier type of approach. Again, it's, it's like complete opposites. And, I, and this is one of the patterns that I saw over and over again over here. And I, I got into detail about that on a couple of the uh, stories throughout the book. Boy, that, that is uh, so interesting and so critical to know. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and again, like I'm not here to say, you know, this person's wrong, this person's right. wrong. It's about knowing yourself because if you can go into that situation and go, okay, wait a minute, um, I'm under stress here. I'm getting louder. I'm getting more task focused. I'm getting more direct. Yeah. And this person who seems to be the opposite of me in every of these aspects is doing the complete opposite as well. Under stress, people who are those opposite types tend to repel away from one another. And if you want to ruin an international mm -hmm. relationship quickly, you just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> that, that's what tends to happen. That's so interesting. I, I'll, I'll tell you, um, the same is true in the United States between like the North and the South. Yeah, you can, yes, absolutely. Right? Uh, I, was, I thought you were going to go even further into detail between, uh, you know, husband and wife. Like, like oh. they, <laughs> you can <laughs> well, go down to very detailed <laughs> levels here. Of, of yeah. This. So, yeah, this is by no means an international conflict thing, but I think the framework applies in so many different situations. I, I, my first sales job was cold calling out of Boston. And, you know, you'd see a New York... Uh, area code, and then you'd see an area code from I don't know Tennessee or or you know South yeah. Carolina, and you'd have to change everything as the, as the phone's ringing because you know that your style that's going to work in New York is probably not going to work in Tennessee. And again, you never know who's going to pick up the phone, but this yeah. it, it's kind of a best first guess as a way to start thinking about some of these variations. Yeah, no kidding. It is just, it's reminding me of when I went to Tennessee to open an office for the company I was working for. And someone said to me, Diane, these people would rather go fishing than, right. than and you just need to know that it's much slower here. I'm thinking, okay, well, I don't know how we're going to hit quota if it's that much slower. I know. Here. I know. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an international example. Um, and I, I deal with this because a lot of, it's, it's funny, there's a lot of Australians here, a lot of um, Brits compared to Americans. So I, I have a lot more, I've, I've got ex examples from all over, but often you'll get say a British uh, manager who might, or executive who might come over from headquarters in the UK and come to, to a place like Singapore. Again, we'll use Singapore just as one example. Yeah. And they come into the office, they, they, the, the numbers aren't looking good and it's 12 o'clock and people disappear and they or you know the manager the executive gives a rousing speech hey we've got to double our efforts to make make the numbers let's do this and then everybody disappears for a 90 minute lunch and <laughs> the, the executive's going what the heck is this this is like this is the where's the sense of urgency here and so then at five o'clock comes what does he do he wants to take people out to a pub to get to know them better because that's part of the plan <laughs> well, here, people don't want to go to the, and again, I'm speaking in massive generalities, yeah. but generally speaking, people don't want to go and build relationships at the pub. They build relationships at lunch. Oh. And, 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 you know, oh. if, if you, and there's a, 
there's a whole kind of aha moment that I went through, which is, yeah, you've got to, you've got to do this at lunch. This is not a pub relationship building place. This is a lunch place. And, and in so many situations, what companies do is they go, we're behind on the numbers. Uh, everybody, you know, bag lunch at your desks. We're going to work through lunch to get this done. And you want to, you want to ruin a group <laughs> dynamic here. That's the, that's what you could do. Wow. Uh, you know, and I, I've kind of joking. Well, it's not even joke. I, I go, I, I was explaining this to a, a British counterpart. I said, you know, go back to your office in the UK and tell them that they can't go out to the pub after work. He goes, no, no, yeah, there'd be riots. I was like, well, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So those are some examples. That that thank you for that. That that is so interesting. I mean, we assume that everyone works the way we do, yeah. and they don't. Yeah, and I, you know, and that that's it. It's just, um, and and you can. I had this very uh, stodgy, traditional Australian guy from Perth. He was in construction industry and uh, he, they expanded into the region outside of Australia. And this every, you know, this guy was the dominant, grumbly, just direct, just get the damn job done with much worse language, uh, you know, solve the problem over a couple of beers and then, and that's it. And that was how he would deal with his, his team. And he inherited or he ended up building or getting this team across Southeast Asia who had incredibly different styles. And I had to, I was coaching him through this transition because it wasn't working. People weren't listening to him. They weren't responding to him. He wasn't getting results. And he said, you know, all of these things that you're telling me about these invisible differences, I don't give a crap. These guys have to work for me they have to do it <laughs> my way. And I said, look, you know, you can, you can be right and and fail or you can adjust <laughs> and and get you know and get across the get this done yeah. so if, if you want to get things done you've got to drop what you think is the right way to get stuff done yeah yeah that's yeah. a huge lesson wow yeah yeah and that took me many many painful years to figure out <laughs> you were speaking from experience <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, I'm going to take a quick sponsor break and then I have some more questions for you. Sure. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. While Audible.com has thousands of audiobook titles that you can choose from in, you know, a variety of genres, what you might not know is that they also have podcasts, Audible Originals, guided meditations, and so much more. Uh, I personally enjoy the guided meditations, especially these days. Uh, and I will tell you that one of the things that I think I like most about audible.com is that because they have all this different kind of content all in one place, I don't have to switch around to get whatever it is I'm looking for. So it's like one-stop shopping for uh, audio entertainment. Uh, so we are offering you a free trial. You can go to audibletrial.com slash business growth, sign up for that free trial and explore the variety of programs and audiobooks for yourself. Today we're speaking with Kyle Hegarty about how to grow from an accidental to intentional business nomad. So, um, it's, this is so interesting for me and, and the timing of it because we are in, in the midst of this. We, we live in a ever uh, smaller world uh, and currently we are constrained uh, to some degree with mobility, you know, physical mobility. So it can be somewhat hard to read people's body language and, yes. and really immerse yourself in um, culture. So, I'm curious if you have some thoughts on like the future skills uh, that, that we really need to know now. The, um, the, the work from home, the remote work situation, this is a bit counterintuitive, but 
we're seeing it, it's accelerating the international conversations um, where, whereas someone might have done his or her business trips to different parts of the regions uh, once a month, or once a quarter, once a year, now these same teams are a, a click away from a conversation. And so we're actually seeing the uh, headquarters, and let's just say hypothetically that headquarters is in the US, which is statistically the case in many situations. They're actually communicating more with their satellite offices and partners around the world than ever before. And so this, ironically, it's actually increased communication uh, over overseas because people aren't using, oh, well, we'll chat when we meet up next, next month, which is kind of wow. interesting. Yeah. So, so that doesn't though, but, but your point is absolutely correct, which is there's, there really isn't um, an even or equal replacement to doing face-to-face -face business as far, in my opinion, I, I think that the face-to-face -face stuff really does make, uh, make a difference, yeah. but our hands are tied. So we don't have, we do not have that luxury or that choice. So you've got to make the best of what you've got. Uh, with, with Zoom, with Skype, with all of these communication tools, the ability to communicate is out there. I, I have this kind of, I think ironically that techno communication technology has grown exponentially and improved exponentially, but that doesn't have anything to do with communication itself, which has flatlined, if not gotten worse. Uh, because, you know, we, we get onto these calls, we have fixed agendas, we plow through things, we ask if anybody has any questions, any challenges, no, okay, great, let's, uh, let's wrap up and move forward. But that example that I just gave, an agenda, uh, asking direct questions, looking for group feedback quickly in that setting, that, that works in North America. But statistically speaking, it doesn't work in about 70% of the planet based on, really? based on culture data. Uh, uh, you know, there, so, so let's talk about the data for a second so I can yeah. put that into context. Because I was just trying to get my head around this years ago as well. And I stumbled into these data sets. Uh, I'm not the only one who wrestles with this. And this has been a challenge for decades, if not millennia, but uh, over the last few decades, there has been cross-cultural behavioral research that has actually looked at business working style differences in different parts of the world. And there are a number of ongoing studies that look at how do people communicate in the US versus the UK versus France versus yeah. China. Uh, how, do, how do they do business how do they negotiate? How do they give feedback? How do they handle conflict? How do they handle showing up on time? Uh, and and they, there's a bunch of these survey questions. They look at other data from, from different countries and it's macro results, which basically you get this data set that's scored, everything's scored in comparison. And you can start looking at Okay, well, according to the data, the US is direct uh, and they're close to Germany and they're close to the Netherlands. And on the opposite side of the spectrum of indirect speakers is uh, Japan, Thailand, Indonesia, China, India's on the other side of that spectrum. And so right now, all of a sudden, we're talking about communication style differences. And, and a direct versus indirect is probably the easiest place to start. Uh, if I were to ask you, you know, if I were to explain this data set to you and say, you know, does that make sense? Uh, do you have any questions? You would probably tell me, you'd say, well, wait a minute, hold on. You, 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 you just talked about a lot of stuff. Well, you know, walk me through this in more detail. Possibly that might be your answer. Yeah. If I were to say that to somebody in another part of the world, say, you know, does that make sense? What I just explained to you, they would automatically say yes. The reason is, is because in some parts of the world, it's rude to say no. Oh my gosh. And so that, and that's the, in such a simple example, but statistically speaking, I don't know, 70% of the planet 
have this indirect communication style <laughs> and the sales training, the marketing, the, the grad school, the business school training, all of these leadership development courses, all of them are created from direct speaking cultures that have very low hierarchy assumptions, meaning, you know, everybody is kind of um, in sort of a flat hierarchy scenario. Yeah. Whereas the majority of the planet is the exact opposite. Wow. So you can use the data as a starting point to get your head around this and then to kind of realize, okay, you know, we're not in, we're not in Kansas anymore. (laughs) (laughs) So, so, so I use, I use that as, um, as a massive tool, going back to your hypothetical of, you know, what would I explain to somebody walking into Singapore? So we talked about knowing yourself in a little bit more detail, but then use this data, like start using this stuff to get a better visual idea of what these potential invisible things might actually look like. And then I start working with people on, okay, well, what are the uh, tactics that we could apply to start overcoming this? How could we change these conference calls so that they achieve the results that we're trying to achieve? Right. Right. Yeah. And, and right. one of the and one of the first things is, and this is this I, I teach people this all the time, or I work with people on it. You've got to get rid of close-ended questions. Uh, a close-ended question is one that basically is asking for a yes or a no. So if you are communicating with people in other parts of the world who don't necessarily answer direct questions in that way because that's not the way things are done where they're from you are asking for a failure a fail that your communication is going to fail statistically speaking the majority of the time by asking such a simple close-ended question so what do you do about it you break that you get that out of your vocabulary temporarily uh, I had for a number of years, because I was managing teams and all sorts of all, all over the place, I had printed on my wall a, uh, a, a page that simply said, I wonder if, and that, that helped prompt me to change my, how I would wrap up a call. Uh, because I would normally say, okay, everybody, uh, any questions? Does that make sense? And then <laughs> silence. So instead I would say, I wonder if each of us could very quickly walk through what you just heard and walk us all through your next step. And that wow. simple change has, uh, has personally saved me a lot of, a lot of heartache and, and money. <laughs> <laughs> you you want to get right down to it. <laughs> you know what's interesting about that? I, I think that is a great um, process to use anywhere in general in general yeah yeah, yeah. right uh, because then that, that's how you know yeah what they because look for exactly to your point about body language like if you're having a conversation with somebody and they're clearly uncomfortable and they might even be uncomfortable about speaking up but they might express that in a visual way or even, even, uh, you know, in their tone, which sometimes doesn't come across, you know, in a call, uh, certainly doesn't come across in an email or a text. Right. So because of that, because we're all working remotely now, I think that's a universal best practice, which is, I call it, um, I call it ultimate active listening. And so active listening, of course, is when you have, you know, you, you, you paraphrase or rephrase what you just heard. Yeah. Uh, I call ultimate active listening, basically asking someone to replay the entire conversation or, you know, walk me forward next in the next step. So it's kind of like, it's like play this back for me. Yeah. So we're, we're all on the same page and it, it takes a little bit more time, but sometimes we're talking an extra minute or two on a call, which can save <laughs> Huge, huge time down the road. Exactly. That right. That's what I was just going to say. I mean, it, yeah. it doesn't necessarily take more time if it saves everyone. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it ultimately, yeah. it ultimately re, uh, contracts the time. Yeah. But, 
people people hesitate on it. Sometimes they don't feel comfortable doing it. It takes some practice. Yeah, I could see that. I could definitely you gotta, see that. You've got to be careful with tone and delivery because you don't want to yeah. sound too patronizing and, and, and condescending. So you've got, you do have to be careful. And in some cases, uh, I actually, I have people be upfront and say, uh, before we wrap up, here's how we're going to wrap this up. And this is not me, you know, I'm not trying to micromanage everybody, but what I found is that on these virtual teams, uh, sometimes things do get lost and, and, and misunderstood. So this is a great way before we wrap up to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And I real I like that a lot because I think um, there, especially in a situation like this, but there are situations where we should be over communicating yes. because I think, you know, we have a tendency to under communicate yeah. thinking yeah. everybody's on the same page and, and knows all the same stuff. And it's not necessarily true. It, and you know, where the, the remote working has these unintended consequences because even if, like, if you were to give me instructions and I'm going to say yes, just and I don't, I still don't know what the heck you're talking about. Yeah. Back in the day, I could go to my colleague and be like, "What the heck does she want from me?" And maybe I can yeah. get an answer. It's harder when I all of a sudden that you know that conference call ends and I'm sitting in my echoey little room, you know, and, and there's nobody to talk to. Yeah, so these little things kind of add up, and and that's why, um, you know, working remote does have multiple components to it. Okay, so um, we identify our own way of communicating, and then we ask ourselves, you know, the question. So the other person I'm talking to, what is theirs? Um, is there? I'm thinking about like these cultural differences. Um, Diane, here, here's one way to do it. Diane, I wonder yeah. if you could walk us through a summary of what we've just reviewed here today. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can do that. So, if I heard you correctly, <laughs> right? What That's we right. talked about is, um, so I, I love this concept. I am curious about if there's a way to turn these cultural differences into assets. That is the ultimate goal. Um, when you have, the, 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 all, every, in some ways what we've been talking about today sounds almost negative or like obstacles. They are obstacles because you've got you've to overcome these differences. But at the same time, we've, I think it's clear that people see the world in different ways, which okay. also means they solve problems in different ways. Um, and if you can get to the point where you can start understanding these different approaches to problem solving, you've just added multiple layers of potential answers to get from point A to point B. And oftentimes it is the dominant communicator, the person who is speaking a lot and you know asking close-ended questions, he or she's the one who kind of is is almost saying, okay, here's how we're gonna do it. And there might be other options that are not being discussed because they haven't been allowed to be discussed based on some of these parameters that we've just talked about. So if you can get to the point where your team or your partners are overseas or your clients can better communicate and feel better, feel more comfortable about opening up, you start seeing different potential ways to solve problems. And to me, that's the beginning of innovation and creativity. Uh, and that to me is, is, you know, you're on the right track when you're heading down that path, because there are things being solved, you know, there are global problems right now that are being solved in wildly different ways in different parts of the world. And we can borrow and, see, you know, like we can take ideas from other parts and apply them domestically, you know, and vice versa. So this is the kind of cross pollinating of ideas that I'm, I'm ultimately trying to get at with my clients. Yeah, I, I love that. I think when people are open to the idea and, and are curious and think to themselves, I want to learn how 
other cultures are handling things like, um, you know, I, I connected with a woman on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, she reached out to me to connect. She's from Sweden, which I didn't realize when she first did. But anyway, you know, right now we do this. So has, um, have you been terribly affected by uh, the pandemic? And she explained so much to me about Sweden that I had no idea mm. in this message. And I thought, wow, see, now that is fascinating. And it changes for me how I then absorb information about different countries dealing with yes. quote, the same situation. Yeah, this, this is a, um, we are in the middle of a epic case study. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> put, it, put it mildly, uh, to see how, you know, different, different regions handle this. Um, yeah. And yeah, you know, we, to, to be continued on that, but um, one, one thing that I have, and I can link to it, or I can give you the link on, on my web, actually on the end of the book, there is a link for a bunch of resources on my website. And so the, the link is only found on the book, right? So you've got to, you know, you got to get the book for the series. There you go. Uh, but one of the documents that people can download, it's just a series of questions that get teams to start communicating and, and asking, I think, smarter, more calibrated questions that get at understanding faster these different working styles. Now, I'll, I'll give you a quick example, which would be, you know, uh, you're, you're all of a sudden finding that you're partnered with somebody in India. Uh, well, a quick, you know, as, as, you're, as you're trying to introduce each other, well, typically what happens if you have this partnership and maybe you're talking to somebody in California and I'm from Boston and what do you do? Well, you, oh, okay, I, you know, we've both been to those places. We talk about sports. We talk about a couple things and there, we've bonded, our rapport is established and then you move on. It's not the same in India, right? Because, because yeah. if you're in Ohio or Boston or wherever, where do you even start? And so typically what you do is you kind of, oh, well, India, what's that like? Oh, okay, great. Anyway, let's get into this. Instead, <laughs> Uh, which, by the way, is the exact opposite of how it's done there, which is like more relationship building first. So you've got to actually step a little bit out of your norm and start asking, I think, a little bit, um, maybe some additional questions. And an example could be, you know, out of curiosity, like what, what is one business difference that you wish that outsiders understood about how business gets done where, where you are? Uh, what's what's one podcast I should listen to that would give me great insight into the business environment in Mumbai? What's one book, That's right? That's so well, great. Tons of these, right? And, and, and so yeah. it's just, just having to like, and I, I, all of these ideas I, I, I don't think are overly radical, they're, but they're really important to, to do. And so I highly recommend people spend a little bit more time um, asking this, going through this process, because this will help with your team building. This will help with your partnership expansions. You know, any type of, uh, and again, same thing domestically, right? You could you could put variations on this to make it sure. more appropriate as well. But I'm just coming at it from an international standpoint. Well, I really, I'm so glad that you shared that because one of the questions that was moving around in my head was. In how do you ask someone to help you understand their culture? And you just gave some great examples yep. of you know questions you can ask. That that's really great. Thank you for that. Now you mentioned the book, and so and and let me just say I I so appreciate this conversation. I, it has been eye opening for me, and so I'm therefore I'm pretty sure it has been for the listeners as well. Will you share with us, you know, how they find you, how they get the book, whatever sure. you think so we should know. I, I am, uh, I can be found on, uh, LinkedIn is my main um, social media. So it's my name or it's, um, yeah, so it's my name, Kyle Hagerty. You, I, I pop up pretty fast, hopefully, on, on LinkedIn. My website is leadershipnomad.com and the book, there's the book, 
information is scattered, splattered all throughout that website. So you can't avoid it if you go to the website. Uh, if any of these topics are of interest, I send out a once, a, just a simple newsletter. It goes out once a month with a couple of core ideas. I don't, I only bother people once a month. So I try and keep it as un, you know, uh, minimally invasive as possible. Uh, the book is available hopefully everywhere. Uh, certainly on Amazon, it's an ebook. They've just, uh, I think there's a summer promotion on the ebook price right now. So you could do that and on anywhere you get an e ebook. Audible, your uh, wonderful sponsor, I, I'm a big fan. Uh, we, have a, we, we are doing an Audible, but it hasn't, hasn't been made yet. So can't, can't do that just yet, but that's coming down the, down the road. But I, I would say the ebook and the hardcover book is available now on any of the main book sites that people get their, get their stuff from. Excellent, thank you <clears throat> so much for that. And um, when it is on Audible, you know, this episode will be out there so people will know to go One, look for it. Yeah. One other point I, I would yeah. say that I'm doing this, um, I've just started this program, which is a five week series, which is, uh, it's a live session. So people, there's only 10 people in each session we do a live uh, uh, Zoom call where we go through in depth a lot of these tools that we've just talked about. So we go through the behavior profiling, we go through the cross-cultural data, we go through the calibrated storytelling as it applies from more of a global perspective, uh, and then some of the tools that we've mentioned as well. And it's designed to get managers, team managers, anybody who's got an international, especially international team, just get them up to the next level of, of global communication. And so that there's information on that on my website as well. I'm wow. doing one session on in US time zones to make it um, palpable for, for people. Uh, so I'm doing kind of sessions in the US and then sessions in Europe and then sessions in Southeast Asia. Which wow. Is kind of yeah, it sounds wonderful. Thanks for, for sharing that. Um, Let's make sure that that's on the show page as well. Sure, I'll send you the link to that. Okay, great. That's terrific. Thank you. And listeners, thank you. Uh, you are who we are doing this, bef doing this for. Uh, and I would also like to thank our sponsor. Go to audibletrial.com slash business growth to get your free trial of audible.com. Check it out. Check out all of the content that they have. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, Pip -pip -pip Powder Donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Imagine how fast we could solve the world's biggest problems if more SaaS startups would gain traction sooner. Welcome to the Tech Entrepreneur on a Mission podcast. This podcast is dedicated to sharing experiences from B2B SaaS CEOs who are going above and beyond to deliver change that is noticed. You will hear their secrets and learn what is required to build a SaaS business that the world starts talking about and keeps talking about and how to overcome the roadblocks to do so.